Te pūtahi o te ao, he wāhi tapu, the centre of the universe. A place to settle, a place to visit, a place to reunite, a place to meet, an ancient place, a changing place, a place to launch a future from, a place to return at the end. Kokorarata, Port Levy, home. Within the largest tribal territory in New Zealand, Kokorarata is a tiny area on the east coast of the South Island. Kokorarata is on the northern side of a region known at different times as Te Pataka o Rakai Hautu, Horomaka, Banks Island and Banks Peninsula. Even this tiny bay has been named and renamed with the comings and goings of different people. Port Olive, Port Albert and most familiar today, Port Levy. But for the long-term settlers and kaitiaki of the area, it is Kokorarata. The modern day face of Kokorarata and its people is Te Runanga o Kokorarata, a customary land council. The Runanga is one of 18 Papatipu Runaka throughout Te Waiponamu. Each one represents a constituent area of the overall tribal authority, Te Runanga o Ngaitahu. Te Runanga o Kokorarata meets with its members once a month to protect the past and plan for the future. The Runanga also provides a centre point for the more than 4,000 people that affiliate to Kokorarata from all over the world. From its office in Christchurch City, the Runanga's opinions are voiced on matters of business, community and environment. This way, the people of Kokorarata continue to participate in the future of their land as they have for hundreds of years. Te Runanga o Kokorarata's boundary extends well beyond Port Levy itself. In fact, all Runanga boundaries are said to be based on traditional settlement areas. But who defined these boundaries? When? Why? And who for? Although the Runanga oversees a large territory today, little of the land within it is owned by the people. Most is government or privately owned. The only land that has never left Māori hands are parts of a small reserve area mapped out in 1849. This reserve land is the focal point for settlement, politics, buildings and life of the hapū today. But hapū life used to extend throughout the bay and well beyond. How did it go from so much to so little? To find the answer, we travel back in time, almost 200 years. Land loss and territory disputes were nothing new to Ngaitahu. Migration and integration had shifted many boundaries. But in the 1820s, Ngaitahu was in the midst of a war with itself. The Kaihuanga feuds had been raging for nearly 10 years, especially in the Canterbury area. Bad blood had spread throughout Te Waiponamu. It was civil war. It seemed as if Ngaitahu was its own worst enemy, but no, he was on his way. Te Raubaraha had already devastated the people of the Sounds and Kaikoura coast, but he was outwitted when he got down to Kaiapoi. Te Raubaraha returned to the South Island for vengeance in the 1830s. His lust for Ngaitahu blood was so compelling, Ngaitahu stopped fighting each other and united. They were about to endure horrors that would wipe out almost the entire population of Canterbury in just two years. First, Te Raubaraha destroyed the pa and people at Takapuneke. Then he turned to Kaiapoi. Kaiapoi pa was a massive Ngaitahu trading post. It's estimated of the 1,000 people there when Te Raubaraha attacked, only 200 survived. A few fled for safety over the hills to Kokorarata. The original inhabitants of Port Levy stayed at the head of the bay, at this time known specifically as Kokorarata. The Kaipoi refugees settled at Puari Pa. The two settlements were considered quite separate. 
but death and disaster had not finished. Te Rauparaha continued his slaughter at Ōnawe Peninsula, further reducing Ngaitahu's population to just a handful of families. The people, particularly those of the Canterbury region, had sustained a decade of civil war and a fleet of Ngāti Toa invaders. They could not endure much more. Then disease arrived. Like indigenous people worldwide, there was no immunity or cure for foreign infections. A measles epidemic ravaged the tiny population of Horomaka. By 1838, Wakaroa, or Pigeon Bay, had a population of 20, 11 men, 9 women, and no children. Survivors weren't just devastated in number. After burying their children, they were close to broken in spirit. But things were to pick up. The following year, Te Rauparaha released his prisoners from Kaiapoi. They returned south and joined their families at Puaripa. The combination of the original Port Levy residents, plus the Kaiapoi refugees, and now the Kaiapoi prisoners, swelled numbers at Port Levy. In 1845, the first Pākehā census of southern Māori noted Puaripa's population was 450, the largest on the peninsula. That figure has since been challenged. It's now thought the entire Māori population on the peninsula was less than 200. But either way, Puari was lively, and not just with Māori. Sealers, then whalers, from England, France, Australia and America had been in Te Waipaunamu for the last 40 years. Traders, early settlers, boat makers and ngaitahu from elsewhere converged on Puari. 250 acres of land was under cultivation, producing potatoes, maize, pumpkins and other vegetables for sale. Pigs, fresh water and flax were also available to buy. Business was booming. Soon the Wesleyan faith came to the bay, followed by the Anglican Church. A French sea captain working out of what's now known as Littleton saw the business boom in whaling and goods. Captain Jean-Francois Langlois thought Banks Peninsula would be a lucrative colony for France. With the French king's backing and business investors' money, he set up plans for France to colonise Horomaka, starting at Akaroa. But the English, already building a gigantic empire throughout the world, were interested in New Zealand themselves. They were already well established in the North Island and were planning to take the South Island too. France was a threat. While Langlois was away in France, William Hobson rushed to New Zealand to represent Queen Victoria, the English monarch. A contract was quickly drawn up between the English Queen and Tangata Whenua to secure New Zealand as a British colony. On the 30th of May 1840, a copy of this contract, Te Tiriti o Waitangi, had its first Ngaitahu signing at Ōnuku in Akaroa. It was then signed at Ruapuke and Otago. The exclusive contract between England and the indigenous people of New Zealand was official. It took some time for the French to accept defeat, but they eventually did. England paid £4,500, about a million dollars today, to buy out the French and compensate them for land they'd bought around the peninsula. This included some land at Kokorarata. Many have studied New Zealand history of this period but few have focused exclusively on the South Island. Even fewer have studied the impact this period had on Ngaitahu. But one who has is award-winning historian Harry Everson. For over two decades, Harry Everson's work has contributed hugely to Pākehā and Māori understanding of colonial history and its impact. Such as Mr Everson's expertise that in the 1980s he was invited to assist Ngaitahu with its historic claim before the Waitangi Tribunal. Mr Everson's evidence contributed to the settlement of the Ngaitahu claim. He has detailed insight into the time, people and attitudes that saw Ngaitahu removed from its land to make way for farms, cattle and colonists. Edward Gibbon Wakefield theory of colonisation and coming to a place like New Zealand the colonists were doing the, uh, the Maori people a good turn uh, because according to Wakefield and the government adopted this, this the British government had agreed 
Chris Wakefield's theory that the Maoris didn't really need the land and, and didn't know how to use it. This, these were the ideas that the colonists had when they came here they, and that they were doing the Maoris a good turn by replacing them on the land and um, uh, showing how to use it properly, you see. So it was all in the, in the mind. That, that was the philosophy behind it. Hungry for land in the South Island, Queen Victoria's representative travelled to Akaroa in 1847. Governor George Grey met with Ngaitahu leaders and explained he would pay cash and cattle for farms in return for land. Farms were the way of the future and the key to success. And not only would landowners receive payment, they could also choose the place and size of reserves for them and their families. These reserves would be additional to land already being used as home and food collecting sites. Governor Grey made an offer. For the land from Wairo to Dunedin, he would pay £2,000. That's just under $400,000 today. In 1847, £2,000 would have bought enough stock for about two sheep farms. For the amount of people living from Wairo to Dunedin, two farms was clearly not enough. But some Ngaitahu were willing to do business. Governor Gray left Takaroa, promising to send someone to work out the details. Three months later, Henry Tacey Kemp arrived. His job? Confirm the sale of the block, get Ngaitahu to accept £2,000 over four years for it, and map out where reserves were wanted. Kemp met with 500 or so Ngaitahu in different areas. After plenty of debate and some questionable circumstances, 16 Ngaitahu signed his deed of sale. Today, that deed is known as Kemp's Purchase. The transaction removed most of the South Island from Ngaitahu ownership. As Rangatira signed, Kemp reassured them reserves would be large and many, just as Grey had said. But in truth, the whole time Kemp was in the South Island, he didn't map out a single reserve. When Kemp's boss, Lieutenant Governor Eyre, discovered Kemp hadn't mapped out even one reserve, he was fired on the spot. A replacement was called in to tidy up the mess. Life was about to change for a young man minding labourers near Wellington. At Governor Gray's nod, the 28-year-old tripled his pay, boarded a boat and rose to the esteemed rank of Commissioner for the Extinguishment of Native Title. The man's name was Walter Bulldock Durant Mantell. Mantell was unorthodox, he, he was not religious, he was sardonic, he, he, if not many people liked him, he had no, he, uh, I doubt whether he had very many close friends, uh, but he was very capable, very clever, but he, he, he liked to get the better of other people, he took a pride in that. Mantell launched into his work, tidying up Kemp's loose ends and along the way making enemies with Ngaitahu. Mantell kept records of his encounters. His thoughts, letters and sketches are all preserved in the Alexander Turnbull Library in Wellington today. In Mantell's 1848 diary, he recalls setting up the first reserve for Ngaitahu, the Tuahui Reserve, meant for three or four hundred people. It was an eighth of the size of the area Ngaituahuriri had asked to be set aside. Individual colonists were receiving up to ten times the land for single farms. Mantel carried on, securing acres for the Crown, cheating acres from Ngaituahu. Around this time, the site for the Canterbury settlement was chosen. But William Fox, the man behind the scheme, had struck a hitch. Settlement couldn't start until all land was out of Ngaitahu hands. Kemp's messy work had left a query over one crucial area. The Kemp deed itself says that the deed conveyed all the land down the coast from Kaiapoi to Purehuehu, which would include the peninsula, but, but, but Kemp's deed plan says that the peninsula had had been sold to the French, so there was an ambiguity there. When Fox found out about this, he told Gray that he'd better hurry up and get get that settled and get 
and, and get the peninsula uh, formally uh, established as Crown land. And the way it was to be done was that Gray would deem Banks Peninsula to be part of Kemp's purchase. Therefore, it had already been purchased and that the peninsula would be regarded officially then as a reserve, as a Maori reserve, which the Maoris now agree to hand over to the Crown uh, <coughs> with certain pieces left to themselves. So it was all cooked up and Mantle was the man sent down to do it. Walter Mantel was sent back to Te Waipaunamu. At first glance, the instructions he received were honourable. Exercise the most untiring patience and indefatigable perseverance in all inquiries or discussions with the natives. But in fact, they spelled out ominous orders. You should use your influence to induce the natives to take their reserves in as few localities as possible, in as limited a number of reserves in each locality as you can persuade them to agree to. Before heading to Horomaka, Lieutenant Eyre suggested to Mantel if Ngaitahu resisted selling, Mantel should not be afraid to play hardball. When Mantel questioned whether the Maoris, what would happen if the Maoris didn't accept being dictated to like this, Eyre told him you've got to carry matters with a high hand. Mantel noted Eyre's suggestion in his diary, but translated it into Greek script in case anyone should see such a sinister instruction. The thing that were of interest on Peninsula from the point of view of colonial settlement were the three harbours, Port Cooper, or Littleton, whatever you may call it, Whakaropu, Port Levy, and Akaroa. Walter Mantell and surveyor Octavius Carrington started work in July 1849. They began at Whakaropu, known then as Port Cooper, and today as Littleton. A tiny native reserve was created at Pudo first. Just over a week later, a reserve at Rapaki was surveyed and mapped out, all without the agreement of the local owners. The rest of the land was absorbed into the Port Cooper block. After getting the necessary signatures and ignoring all objections, Mantel issued a copy of the reserve map and left. Crown business surged ahead. Port Cooper was clear enough. You can see the, easily the boundary of it. Everyone knew what Akaroa was, uh, but, but that, so that left the rest of the peninsula, you see. Now, Mantle had been told to secure the whole peninsula. So he decided that having done Port Cooper, and then he'd go over to Akaroa and do that last, then all the rest of it would go in the Port Levy box, so he did that. He didn't want to go and, and, and spend his time negotiating with every community when he knew he could bluff, bluff them all. Well, well Gray had told them, uh, just, just tell them that the, it's Crown land already, and, and so that's what he did. Just as on his last trip to Te Waipoinamu, Walter Mantel kept a series of private journals and sketchbooks. Within these pages are daily accounts of Mantel's work, the people he met, conversations he had, and his own private thoughts, all written in his own hand. They are some of the few remaining first-hand records of discussions and events that would have an everlasting effect on the land and its people. On the 15th of August, 1849, the Commissioner for the Extinguishment of Native Title arrived in Kokurarata. Walter Mantel was given a house to stay in by his host, the senior authority of the area, Apira Pukenui. Pukenui lived at Kokorarata. Māori Land Court records of 1868 document his hapū as Ngai Tūte Huerewa and Ngāti Huikai. After his baptism in 1841 at Puaripā, he was known as Abraham, as well as Apira Pukenui. In the 1857 census of Kokorarata, Pukenui is recorded as 46 years old, meaning he was born around 1811. He is denoted as literate, Roman Catholic, and a farmer of wheat and potatoes, with one horse, one cow, and ten pigs. Of most importance was Pukenui's leadership. Pukenui was rangatira of Kokorarata 
and Wakaroa, Pigeon Bay. One of Pokenui's many roles was to manage the growing tension between the groups in Port Levy, the original Ngāti Huikai inhabitants, and those seeking refuge from Kaiapoi. Pokenui was quite a... Um, I would imagine him as quite a, 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 a dignified and, and purposeful uh, chief who was trying to do the best for his people and as, <clears throat> as a rangatira he, he wasn't afraid to assert himself where he thought it was necessary. Inside the house, Mantel looked forward to unwinding after the long walk from Port Cooper. But as diary shows, land discussions began that night when Pukenui and others arrived at his door to talk. Wednesday, 15th of August, 1849. A long talk of the land from Kaituna to Flea Bay, as marked on the chart. Demand reserves at Port Levy, Pigeon Bay and Kawatea, commonly called O'Kane's Bay. £500 for eastern and £500 for western part of the block. The day after next, Pukenui and Mantel walked the land to reinforce Pukenui's demands, what was for sale and what wasn't. His conditions were the same as those he'd given the French when they bought land in Kokorarata nine years earlier. Friday, 17th of August. Went with Apira Pukenui to see the boundaries of the land exempted from the French purchase and which he wishes to retain as a native reserve from Te Pare a Hine Te Ata to Puketi. The reserves Pukenui specified at Port Levy and O'Kane's Bay were for food gathering, housing, trade, sovereign and historical reasons. But the third was different. Pukenui led Mantel on a two and a half hour walk to Pigeon Bay. Living within Pukenui's territory was a man known as Tikau. His trading name was John Love, and it was under this name that he signed Te Tiriti o Waitangi at Onuku nine years earlier. Tikau was at Akaroa when Governor Gray came the year before. At that time, he asked Gray to leave a special part of Pigeon Bay out of any future purchases. Gray agreed. And now that his representative, Walter Mantell, had arrived to map out the reserves, Tikau needed to make sure Mantell understood the agreement. Puari, 18th of August, 1849. Apira Pugenui thinks this, that I should remind you about the discussion about Pigeon Bay to clearly outline the area the governor agreed to. My son was born there. That is to say, it is up to the people to decide the reserve as they see fit, to ensure the area is not drawn out incorrectly. That is all. To Mantle, from John Tikal. Tikal says his son was born at Pigeon Bay. But Mantel's records differ. Here is Mantel's entry for the day he and Pukenui walked to Pigeon Bay. Reaching the grave of Tikal's child, Puki said a piece there might be reserved. According to what he pointed out, about 80 acres. A grave? Or a birthplace? Either way, it was not for sale. Tikal, and now Pukenui, had reserved it. So far Mantel had listened to Pukenui's conditions, but never responded. Things were about to change. He, Peter, then requested to know what would be the amount of final payment from Kaituna to Flea Bay. I said £300. Of course, he was dissatisfied, having demanded £1,000. Back in Port Levy, leaders from neighbouring areas came to negotiate their own sale terms with Mantel. As groups arrived, disputes broke out over boundaries, entitlement and ownership. Mantel looked on. And he knew that because in any Maori community there's divisions based on whakapapa and ancestry and he could play off one against the other. One group you could identify as a group led by Pukenui who lived at Kokorarata, that was their home patch. Then at, at Puari there where um, Ngaitu Ahuriri had, had built a pa, their home patch as we know was Kaiapoi and Tuahiwi. Nevertheless they would have considered, I think, that they, they should have been given land around uh, Puari and up, up that end of the bay. Then all around the coast had Maori settlements 
or had had Maori settlements. So those people had an interest in, the, in, in that block because they were living on it, even though they had nothing to do with Port Levy. And then from over the hill there was a group of Ngati Erekehu, led by Tamakeke and Maopo, who came over to contest with Mantle over his proposal to include Kaituna and Waikakehi. Māori were frustrated. Mantel was impatient. He'd been in Port Levy for 10 days. He and Carrington had made no progress. The debates continued. Friday, 24th August. AM to a meeting of ancients. The Korero Tūpuna about Kaituna not done yet. Had headache all day. Next day, tensions erupted. Walter Mantel's most passionate opposer confronted him. Saturday, 25th of August. Went out at Aapeta's request to their kaika to hear what Tamaki had to say, as he wanted to return to Waireo on Monday. A long speech. Two hours. Mostly an abuse of my award of 300, praising the French and abusing the English. One thousand pounds or nothing. I will keep my own land for my children and give some to the French if they return. Before they left, Berard and Berlingi told me, if you sell to the French, you will be safe. <laughs> if you sell to the English, you will be driven to the tops of the snowy mountains. One thousand pounds or nothing. Mantel left, but Pukenui, Eva the Rangatira, wanted a deal that would work for everyone. Apira and Pohatu came in in the evening and tried to coax me to accede to their terms. One thousand pounds. But they were turned away. So much for Mantel's instructions to exercise untiring patience and indefatigable perseverance in discussions with the natives. Disputes continued. Pokenui faced challenges to his authority. They were quashed, but more arguments would break out, more debates would arise, and people needed to get home. Crops and families needed attention. Mantel had had enough. Māori were still discussing boundaries and a sale price they could agree on, but Mantel drew the high hand Eyre had suggested. These were his words to Pukenui on the 29th of August. The money is an after-consideration. You imagine it will be increased. I can assure you that I expect no such results. As to the land, that is already the property of the government, owing to my having made an award. If you like to return the money, the governor will praise your conscientiousness. Mantle was a young man, nevertheless he held the, he was a government commissioner and he represented the governor and the governor represented the queen. And when Maori chiefs heard that, they said, well this man, this is somebody, you know, we've got to listen to him. Mantel had lied. As Gray had suggested, Mantel said the land was already crown property through Kemp's purchase. It was all written up and paid for. Mantel wasn't asking to buy it. It wasn't Pukenui's to sell. Pukenui wasn't entitled to a payment. But as a gesture of goodwill, Mantel would award £300. An award was an arrangement which was dictated by the government. We are awarding you this. You can take it or leave it. Rangatira left in protest. Tamakeke and Pukenui tried once more. Thursday, 30th of August. Abel then spoke and next Tamakeke, who again said that unless the sum demanded were given, he would keep his land and so forth. After he had done, I asked if anyone else had anything to say, replied that they all agreed with Tamakeke. I then told them to listen to me. You talk about keeping the land. How can such language apply to land for which payment has already been given? When I came here, my first care was to set apart and have surveyed reserves for you that you might not be driven out of the land. As for the money which I have awarded, I shall not increase it, because it is what I think just, so I see no reason for exceeding the amount of £300 on which I have decided. This money you can take or not. The title to the land will nonetheless belong to the governor. Never mind the money, let me take care of you. If tomorrow is a fine day, I shall direct Mr Carrington to begin the survey of your reserve. You have said the survey shall not proceed until I have assented to your terms. This is foolish. If you really prevent the survey, the boundaries of your land will be vague and undefined. 
and will most probably be narrowed. At this, Tamakeke and Ngaituahuriri leaders left in disgust. Mantel was now in charge. Well, he was a very convincing, what, what in common terms, what we might call a bullshit artist. He got up on the stump and talked very solemnly, and, and the chiefs who were used to the idea that a, a man representing the governor must really be absolutely, uh, uh, you know, responsible and reliable and, and truthful. Uh, they did, didn't realise, uh, really, I think, uh, well, the ones who ended up signing it, had, had, they'd been bluffed. In the morning, Carrington tried to start work. Pokenui stopped him. Mantel threatened arrest. Maybe it was the threat, or the arguments, or disease, or invasion, or war. Whatever the reason, Pokenui gave in. His words to Mantel give poignant insight into his mind at the time, on the 3rd of September, 1849. This is my tikaka. If you will consent, let the survey commence tomorrow morning. I accede to your terms. I wanted the other 200 to distribute to those people to enable them to pay their debts, but now I trouble myself no more about them. They say they will stop the survey. If they do, this is the sin. It can be surveyed at any time. We now care for no reserve at Pigeon Bay. The grave can be combined with the churchyard or the bodies removed there when there is one. I have no children to inherit from me, nor have most of us. At the very time Mantle arrived, to do the uh, Port Cooper and Port Levy deeds. There had been a terrible, another terrible measles epidemic, which according to one account, killed out most of the Maori people, adults and children. So they'd become disheartened by the, the, the death of their, of their children and their young people, and the fight had gone out of them. It was understandable. The survey began. It would determine what hapu would keep and what the crown would take. In one week, the survey was complete. Tuesday, 11th September. Carrington finished survey by 2pm. Though not without final insult to one of the people's most revered areas. About noon, Carrington was perceived on Te Karara. Great excitement, which I had to allay. When the survey was finished, Mantel led Pukenui and others around the only land to remain theirs. Once it would have taken weeks to cover. Now it took four and a half hours. Thursday 13th September. Set out with Apere Pukenui, Paurutaki, John Pere, Hari, Timi, Mamawamutu to walk the bounds. John Pere Dobin Kokowai as we went. In the Port Levy block, Mantel secured 104,000 acres for the Crown. 1,361 acres for Māori. Most of it rocky hillside. In fact, only 300 acres would grow food. Years later, the reserve was found to have just three acres of fertile land per person. Colonisation would create an economy based on agriculture and farming but most productive land had been stripped from hapū. How could the little land they had left ever serve their needs? Carrington completed the plan and Mantel wrote the deed. 25th September. On this day, the Port Levy block purchase deed was signed. 26 Māori names appear on the signature panel, autographs and tohu. It was one of his most powerful arguments. If you don't sign this, you won't have any rights to the reserve. And that, that's a rule he applied. That those who didn't sign the deed were not, didn't get a, a footing in the reserve. What could they do? They, they could have told him to buzz off, but then 
what would have happened then, as we know, the settlement would have gone ahead just the same. Because even at Akaroa they did tell Mantle to buzz off. They wouldn't sign it. But the settlement went ahead just the same. So you could be pretty sure that as the way things turned out, if the, if the people at uh, Port Cooper and Port Levy had refused to sign that, they wouldn't have even got those reserves. That's what Mantle told them, and that's what would have happened. Hearken all the tribes. We, the chiefs and people of all the land within the boundaries here under described, have signed our names and made our marks in token of the consent of us on behalf of our relatives and all our descendants to the final session of all those of our lands. Agrees to pay us the sum of £300, final payment for these lands. The inland boundary commences at Kaitara thence to Te Pohue, and along the ridge us, to Te Ahu Pātiki. It's hereby absolutely given up. That boundary commences. This is the, the only reserve made for us. And Mr Mantel, Commissioner, consents to leave that as a lasting possession for us and our descendants after us forever. This document was written at Kokorata. Port Levy, on the 25th day of September, 1849. Most leaders had withdrawn from negotiations at Port Levy before the deed was signed. Tamakeke was one of Mantel's most vehement opposers, and yet his signature is on the deed. Of the 26 Māori names on the Port Levy deed, 21 appear to be signed in person. Harry Everson believes the remaining five were made on behalf of other people. He believes Po Haramaruru and Apira Pukenui added their names to protect Tamakeke and others from having no rights at all in the only reserve. The next day, Mantel issued his £300 award. He wrote to his employers to confirm the deal was done. Sir, I have the honour to announce to you the conclusion of my negotiations relative to the Port Levy block and to transmit to you the native's receipt for the amount, £300, awarded and distributed to them by me with an attached map of the lands and their native title to which has been extinguished by their payment. I enclose a map of the only reserve in the above district. The only reserve. Three were expected including one at Pigeon Bay, though Pukenui in defeat had agreed to a compromise over the treatment of Tikal's son. Mantel mentioned the issue in a brief letter to the colonial secretary. There is the stipulation mentioned on the receipt for the money. I have, on the back of the government, guaranteed that a small grave at the head of Pigeon Bay, where an infant child of John Tikal is buried, shall be undisturbed until a cemetery be consecrated there. This guarantee on the back of the government has never been honoured. Walter Mantel ignored Ā stipulations. Instead of three reserves, there was one. Instead of paying £1,000, he awarded 300 And to this day, Tikal's son remains unacknowledged at Pigeon Bay. Time went by. Throughout the country, hapū were cut off from their usual sources of food as land was sold to settlers and waterways drained for pastures. They were unable to grow crops on dry land, so lost their ability to trade. With no economic base, they soon became poor and debt-ridden. With poverty came ill health. To pay bills, families sold the only thing they had, reserve land. Soon, many were homeless, landless, and they left the land forever. Meanwhile, Walter Mantel's ambition and intellect had taken him far. He was a Justice of the Peace, member of the Legislative Council, and twice Minister of Native Affairs. But as years went by, the grave consequences of his work in the South Island unfolded. His conscience grew heavy as he recognised the ruthless efficiency of his work 20 years before. Mantel raised issues of Ngaitahu's injustice in the corridors of power, giving evidence at a parliamentary inquiry, supporting Ngaitahu petitions, resigning from his ministerial position in protest of their treatment, 
and writing letters complaining of unfulfilled promises that he had set in place as a younger man. Mantell was summoned to a royal commission investigating native claims. When asked about his work as a commissioner to extinguish native claims, Mantell was blatantly honest about his conduct at Port Levy. This reserve, Port Levy, was lived upon at the time and I marked off the smallest piece possible. I am not prepared to swear that any step taken by me or by the government with respect to these natives was fair. Walter Mantell has been praised for seeing the error of his ways. Harry Everson believed he was a tragic hero and eventual ally to the Ngaitahu people. But Mr Everson has reconsidered his position. I thought that he genuinely um, had a change of heart. But after going through more of his papers... I I don't believe that now. He came down here to carry out Gray's instructions, which were the British government's instructions. Uh, and he did that, and he, got, and he got his money, and afterwards he said he didn't like doing it, but he didn't blow the whistle. So you can't really take people seriously when they when they say years later they, they, didn't, they were sorry they did it. But at the time, they didn't seem very sorry. They did it, willingly. Mantell's token efforts were ignored. Ngaitahu campaigned for generations until eventual settlement with the Crown in the 1980s. Walter Bulldock Durant Mantell, the one-time commissioner for the extinguishment of native title, the man who defined the area left to Māori in his Port Levy block, lived out his years in Wellington. He died there at age 75 on the 7th of September 1895. Today he lies under a pohutukawa in the Karori Cemetery. The Hapu of Banks Peninsula have their own stories of what happened to them. The common thread is that after Mantel's 43-day visit to Port Levy, things were never the same again. Apera Pukenui remained at his home in Kokorarata. His lifetime spanned an era of profound change. He saw the arrival of the first colonists from the Northern Hemisphere. Few, then hundreds. His many gods, reduced to one. His food, animals, plants, clothing, all replaced. A foreign monarchy, a new language, a new justice, legal and education system. And his own people go from absolute authorities over sky, land and sea, to destitute or on scant reserves. Apera Pukenui died on the 21st of August 1879 at 68 years of age. Today he overlooks the landscape he fought so hard to preserve, not for himself, but as a lasting possession for us and our descendants after us forever. Though the land of the Māori Reserve in Kokorarata is small, it is all the community has left. On one hand, it is the tragic result of colonisation. On the other, it is testament to the valiant efforts Tipuna made to provide for their mokopuna. Their efforts will not go in vain, as we protect it today with a view to tomorrow. Even though it is small, it is indeed so very precious. Ahakoa heiti, he ponamu.